Hi everyone, my name is PK and here I have Michael and Nicole in front of me who are, are lovely people waving to you right now <laughs> and are <laughs> clients of the Property Investment Accelerator. But more importantly, um, they're really successful property investors in of their own right. They have, I want to get this right, 11 titles and 17 rentals between them. Michael was an electrician. Um, Nicole was a nurse, is a nurse slightly. Let's, it's complicated. We'll get there. Um, and look, they've just done really well for themselves, but it's been a journey. And so in this episode, stick around. We're going to talk about how they started investing, what got them into it, how their journey has been. Maybe we'll get through a lot of those properties and valuations and why they bought, why not, et cetera, challenges. And then sort of what they're doing now, what their passion is, their, their family people. Um, and so I think a, a lot of you guys will resonate with, with their journey. I know I did, and I'm very grateful to, to have them on. Um, thank you guys. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Oh, thanks, PK. Thanks, PK. <laughs> it's a pleasure to, to be on your show. Uh, I guess to, to start things off, perhaps providing some context. Nicole and I, were both 34. And as you mentioned, we were able to build our portfolio over a uh, 11 to 12 year period thereabouts on modest wages. And I guess if it's perhaps appropriate, maybe we start from the beginning as to how Nicole and I had different upbringings. Yeah, that's actually- Yeah, no, go for it. Yeah, so both our parents migrated to Australia from Poland, but- completely sort of different terms, both in the 80s. Uh, my parents were sponsored over and they came over with my brother, who was four years old at the time. They were educated. They knew English a little bit or at least they could speak English and they had qualifications. But like some migrants, as you know, um, they don't end up using those qualifications and getting, you know, getting by. They need to do something to grow some type of wealth. So my parents ended up building a business, owning their own home, and I saw how they sacrificed working hard for their lifestyle. Mm. And like, for instance, my dad really only had Sundays off, right? But nevertheless, we lived really comfortably. And um, I guess it's very different to what Michael um, endured in his growing up stages. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, in a nutshell, my parents migrated to Australia in the 80s. Uh, Mum was in hospitality. Dad was a fitter machinist by trade. And when they came to Australia, both of them did not know how to speak English. So they uh, sought help from the government and basically went through housing. Uh, and following that, unfortunately, uh, at a young age, my parents split when I was, uh, I think, about three or four years old. And so I was raised by my mum as basically a single mum. And so growing up was quite tough because being on Centrelink, uh, not having a, a stable job, we struggled financially. And so that motivated me to eventually pursue some level of financial independence. Right. The, mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just I was just going to say as well. Um, it, it, both of you have have a kind of you know immigrant story in term in terms of your parents. Um, you might be going here already, but I just wanted to ask: did they did they kind of go out of their way to instill upon you that you should live the Australian dream? Because like we all experience it, the, the first generation does all the hard work, and the second, third gets all the benefit. Did they? Is it because of them that you are property investors? Yeah, it probably touches on, yeah. on on that as well. But for me, it was the the struggle of whenever I wanted to do something or go somewhere, it was always money was always a barrier. And so I, after having experienced that myself, never really wanted to have that barrier in my own life and, and moving down the track of, of when we started our own family. And so that was partly the, the motivation behind how things unrolled over the years that followed. Yeah, whereas mine were a little bit more like yeah, go to uni, get a job and, you know, get a good job kind of a thing. And then I think pretty much 
well, I guess we'll dive into how we started investing and then that will unroll, unravel maybe yeah. <laughs> like the pinnacle points of mind change, right? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have you guys... Well from just working nine to five. Sure. Have you guys, I don't know if this is too personal question, apologies if it is, but because you, you've been investing for a long time, like 12 or 13 years, and you're only 34, like exactly my age as well. So have you guys been together for a long time and invested together the whole time? Or was it like separate then you know, the world's met. No, yeah. So we um we met during school, um, okay. but through the Polish community. So we actually shared some mutual friends who were three to five years older than us. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, I guess, through those friends that um probably inspired Michael first. Yeah. <laughs> to get into uh purchasing his first investment property purely because I think they were like they yeah, were getting so- into property. So because they were slightly older, they were, in, in essence, they, they'd finished school. And so they went to uni. And at that point, they were almost at the completion of uni. Whereas I left school, I became a, an electrician as an apprentice. And so what I realized was, uh, it, it was it only took me till 2010, where I started earning a decent income. And at which point, our friends had already started in investing in property and that was like, oh, well, they're doing it. That's, that's kind of cool. There's no real reason why I can't do it. And so from that point, I worked hard to save myself a deposit of 30 odd thousand dollars and decided I was going to buy my first property. Now, the first property that I bought, I uh, I look back now and I kind of have a, a bit of a laughing moment because it was everything that is not what you do when it comes to investing. So <laughs> to, to provide some context, uh, I bought a property off the plan, which was a townhouse, uh, 5% deposit down and didn't have to do much for a 12 month period whilst everything was getting built. I got all the uh the depreciation uh spiel as to how that was going to help and uh and lower my tax and and everything the sales pitch (laughs) and so that all sounded like a great idea i only had to put half of my deposit what i'd saved down on the property and and i was like well over the next sort of 12 months i can save the difference to to get it across the line and i thought that was great and so fast forward uh i'd say probably about a year uh, I then reconvened after the property had settled. We got a tenant in there. Uh, luckily, it didn't take very long to get a tenant in there. And we got the property revalued. Now, to my surprise, I look back now and I'm like, I was super lucky with how things went. And so what I mean by that is that upon revaluation, the property had gone up enough of an amount that I could refinance to then leverage into property number two and what i mean by that is i literally had earned more in equity that year than i was earning so i was like this is a no-brainer like why wouldn't we we stop and so as a result of that i was like well i did it in this area once why don't i just do it again so i was that in sydney that was in sydney Sydney. out out, uh, western sydney Sydney, near near penrith right can i just ask you a question sorry i know know you so don't want to cut you off but you know, like how you insinuated, as do I, that um, off the plan townhouses or apartments or things like that are often not the best decision and you got sold the dream around depreciation benefits, et cetera. Um, but then it actually did pretty well. Like, you know, call it luck or call it whatever, it actually did work very well. So there's like always a school of thought that says, why is PK, why is Michael, why all these like professionals quote unquote always hating on house and land packages and off the plan apartments and when clearly they've done well you know like so how do you think about that yeah so uh brings you to the second one (laughs) yeah so here we go there is is a property uh, (laughs) that we acquired in our portfolio which didn't do very well i'll i'll put it in it i'll just wrap it in a nutshell so later on in uh in our journey we basically bought or similarly put in a, po- a deposit down on a apartment in the Brisbane CBD, uh, which essentially we held for a few years. We yeah. purchased it at 425 and 
without getting too deep with, because I don't want to con confuse the timeline here, we basically had to sell it at a loss. And I'm talking, we had it on the market for a little while. We were lucky to get what we did. And I think mm. my memory serves me correctly. It was about a $40,000 loss plus the missed opportunities we had in that five-year period. Yeah. Five years, well. Yeah. yeah. So that was just a, like you said, you know, you learn from your mistakes and... Yeah, and so after uh, uh, reinvesting into the second property in the same area and even the same suburb, I thought I could replicate the same thing again. And what happened was that, no, it, it didn't quite go as favor favorably. Uh, the market had already done its thing in those last sort of two years. And so we just kept things uh, just roll and at, at which point then yeah like michael was like hey you know i'm investing do you want to jump on board and like invest as well and then i thought oh yeah but i'm still at uni kind of thing when he was investing and i guess he, because the first investment went so well uh it was during the second investment we started talking about oh maybe you know i'll jump onto the third one let's um you know so he was like well you have to finish your uni degree at least and get a job of some sort so i actually changed the course of my uni and ended up becoming a registered nurse just to get some type of reasonable income so that I could get some type of deposit, you know, like happening and mm -hmm. um, pretty much service. <laughs> yeah, I was basically in the calls here saying, look, just get any job to yeah. help with the serviceability side of things because I wasn't necessarily on a, a high income on my own and I needed assistance and, and uh being able to just join forces so we can borrow and, and purchase our next investment. Yeah, so the next investment was um, it was a it was a good investment, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so <laughs> the third, the next one was uh, very different to the first two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what I mean by that, it was a, a freestanding house in uh, Western Sydney in um, Wentworthville, which is near Parramatta for those listening. And the uh, intent for that property was it was very very tired we actually picked up the the listing on i think it was a day before christmas oh yeah yeah it was uh so everyone was in holiday mode as soon as i saw the opportunity i jumped straight on there to, to arrange a time to go uh and and view the property it was on a large block so being from trade background myself i was like well i know a few tradies i reckon we can uh invest in this renovate it and perhaps do something with the, the the yard in the future, whether that's uh, to subdivide or add value in any right. way. Right. And so we we bought that uh, at five hundred and forty five thousand yeah. thereabouts, and got stuck into the Renault. Mm. <laughs> I quickly learnt after the the timeline that we had initially <laughs> set blew out almost double. Uh, the budget that we set blew out. So there was so many key moments throughout that renovation where we were like, yeah, this isn't as easy as, as we first thought, right? <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I mean, following that, uh, we just pursued with, with how things were going and took those learnings. Uh, we were fortunate enough that even in the following year, uh, when it came to refinancing we we're like oh let's let's see if we can better our rates yeah but when the valuations came in again with the property being renovated and, and a bit of market movement it actually went up in value and so it increased quite substantially i i think it went up by about 150 or or 160 what, what year was this this was this was 20 end of 2013 yeah all right, so it's good timing to buy in Western Sydney. Yeah. 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 So then we were pretty much we were able to leverage that um, and purchase pretty much four and five. So, yeah, we essentially had another two deposits for our next two purchases. Um, Amazing. Yeah, which, which, we, were, <laughs> which were both in Queensland. Yeah, and we flew to the location. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, oh, we need to start diversifying. We can't just constantly invest in New South Wales, perhaps. Let's... The amount of people that I know that live in Sydney and had like one in Western Sydney in 2013 or 14 and then were like, 
Brisbane's about to boom. And then they bought like two or three there. And then Brisbane did nothing. And then Sydney went up like double. They're like, just shoot me now. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so because at the time we we didn't have our, our the same sort of processes that we have today, we were like, well, how do we do our due diligence? Yeah. The only way yeah. we do is the ground. we need to fly there and, and right. chat with the, the people on the ground, get a feel for the suburb. Um and yeah, we 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 came across uh, two particular properties that we we liked and put in an offer, and essentially they they got accepted. Mm. And then I guess that brings us to 2015. Yeah, around when we were getting married, we did a granny, a granny flat on the purchase that we built in uh, Wentworthville. So in Sydney. So yeah, just before we got married, we decided that we were going to build a granny flat to boost our cash flow. Yeah. Yes. And. There was another key lesson that I learned because I was adamant that, again, I'd learned a lot from the renovation. I could do an owner build a granny flat. So to save costs, uh, we'd factored in a, a budget. Uh, and again, the whole process, the timing of it was impeccable. It was literally, we started at six months before we were getting married and we probably finished it about a month beforehand. So there was a lot of, stress right high, high level but again we were like yeah, just learn from it like you know it's sort of like we were novice at that stage sure, you know? you're sure. Learning how you were learning from your mistakes you were learning how you were going kind of thing and then I guess that brings us to and just on that can I can I just interrupt yeah. you like how much did that granny flat cost you and and do you have a sense of how much it revalued up like did you make equity out of that or if it cost you 100 grand or 120 did it just increase the value by 120 yeah so overall cost for us as an owner builder was 74 75k Stop so that. relative to the quotes that we were getting mm -hmm. at the time i think granny flats were in that sort of vicinity between like 110 130 so for, for me that was almost like an, another deposit for a property and that, that was my motive as to, okay, well, I feel like I've got the, the knowledge, the, the the trade experience, and I've got a few contacts where I called in plumbers except for, uh, plumbers and carpenters and all that to assist, and that's how we're able to bring those costs down. Right, right. So that was a good decision then. You made some equity, and it obviously improved your cash flows as well. Yeah, yeah. it did. Right. It, it certainly did. I mean, uh, at the time, I think the granny flat, was the main house was getting about 500 a week and then the granny flat was getting about 320. Yeah, it was a, it so was a, it was a good move for back then. Yeah, so it, it allowed us to be able to to move forward. Yeah. Sure, sure. Makes sense. And I, just before you go on, I just I'm just trying to think of, of what people want to know. And I'm just going to ask you one more question. Oh. You know when you were flying up to to Queensland or Brisbane and um having chats and and I don't know, getting to know the suburb. Like, what does that mean? Uh, were you talking to real estate agents or were you like talking to the local florist or the coffee shop? <laughs> owner yeah, and... that's a really good question. So <laughs> talking to real estate agents and property managers. Yeah. Um, but it was also back then, um, I guess I didn't have the data and like all the, I guess, insight that I have now, right? But I would literally... Um, be marking like where's the housing commission kind of a thing on on an actual map. <laughs> oh, you'd be driving around being like that's housing commission. Well, like X marks sort of spot. knowing it from I guess the locals. Do you right. know where are the good streets, where are the bad streets, where are the more owner oc streets, and where are the favourable streets. You know, and then sort of you get to know the area of like okay, there's a school down the road, there's a there's a hospital down the road, or you know, so that you sort of the landmarks. Yeah. Sure. I'm just playing the devil's advocate here, Nicole. Um, so don't mind me, but like, how's that a bad thing? Cause you know, like all that sounds like really good due diligence. Oh, it's not a bad thing. It's just <laughs> super time consuming. Super time consuming yeah. And you can now do it off Google probably and sure, sure. Um, getting on the phone call and actually talking to people. But um, yeah, is, yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's an emotional thing, you know, it's, you just got to let it go if that's, what you believe in, you know. It's it, it comes down to anything really. When you do something for the first time, you're you're super nervous about it, uh, and you want to be extra cautious that you'll you'll go to extremes 
to to be able to i guess fulfill <laughs> that that gap that you have and so that was the, the way that we were like well that's how we understand it to be so that's what we did yeah exactly right, right. Yeah. And, and it gave you confidence at the time but not to put words in your mouth in hindsight you probably could have achieved all that and more in a much more condensed period of time just over the phone from sydney and um, not giving your money to Virgin or Jetstar or Qantas or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the time, we, we kind of like turned it into a little bit of a trip. But yeah, like yeah. We, were, we weren't just adamant that that's all we were going to do. Like it gave us an opportunity to go there as well. And, and do. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I definitely <laughs> agree with you in that front that there's far more effective uh, resources available uh, at your dis- like at your disposal in today's day and age. But I think technology has changed too yeah, now. It, it has. Right? It like, certainly has. Yeah. Even the courses that we were doing in the past versus what's available now, you had to go in to do the course. You couldn't just yeah. do it online, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then it was like you could only speak to whoever you wanted to speak to face-to-face because, like, that's what was available then. You had to do yeah. that you had that time with them during that course, you know, or something. So mm. it's sort of, I think times have changed for an investor as well. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, you're, yeah. you're so right. I mean, in 2011, when I bought my first one in East Gosford from, I was in Sydney at the time, and I remember calling the property manager and asking them like, oh, hey, do you guys do like inspections? Like I was like high pitch, like, like kind of nervous. And they were yeah. like, no one's, I guess, like no one's ever asked us that before. We, it's okay, we'll do it, you know? And I was like, oh, cool. That means I don't have to drive up to Newcastle or whatever. Yeah. And that, yeah. that was like, that sparked it for me. I was like, property managers, they they, they can be really helpful. But yeah, yeah. Uh, some, I guess, back in the day, you know, for some people, you actually, it builds confidence to go see the place. But I, I never did it, but, you know, there are different strokes for different folks for sure. Um, sorry, yeah. Andrew, please, please carry on. I, I interrupted that thought bubble. No, 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 no. I, no. I like I it. Think, I, I, I think it's, yeah, it's valuable. I reckon it's so valuable. Like now looking at it, do we, now when we're purchasing, do we go out to and like, no, we have property. We actually have property managers and we have our own tradies that we trust as well mm. that will go out and give us the real fine points of what it is that you're getting out of that property. Mm. Um, purely because the property manager is the one that's going to be managing the property anyway. So yeah. you, they know where the rentals start, start from, right? So if right, you do right. that to that property um, mm. and then the trades, well, Michael's so good at trade lingo. And so when speaking to <laughs> trades, when he gets them out to do any type of due diligence on the property or a FISA or something like that, it's very, very like, yeah, concrete in the sense that uh, he knows what he wants um and they can brainstorm as well so right. that's my curve. like I'm jumping now you know to our knowledge now versus what our knowledge was back then and I think mm-hmm. it's like you said for building that confidence and I would say you know if that's a level for somebody to build their confidence then go do it but yeah like you said right now I would say it's just you don't need to you mm-hmm. really yeah, sure 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 okay please carry on yeah and so then following um once where were we? Where were we? we were, Past uh, Queensland. So now oh, we're yeah. going 2016. 16 or, yeah. or thereabouts. Yeah. So at that point, um, Nicole's parents were considering relocating. Oh, yeah, were. Yeah. Um, so moving from Sydney uh, to purchase themselves a retirement Retirement's. up on the central coast. So past, past Newcastle. And one particular weekend, we were like, oh, let's go check out where they're looking at invest to, to invest. And we we stopped by uh, Lake Macquarie uh, just to, to catch some lunch. And <laughs> we just so happened to drive past the property that had a open for inspection sign. So uh, naturally inclined to call and I were like, well, let's well, go check it out. We stopped there because you sort of knew that there was a developer in that area too. Yeah. So, so that's, a, that's a great point. So a yeah. bit, bit of context. Uh, there was a developer in the area that was selling uh, developed land, brand new four bedroom houses in the the sort of price point of mid to high fives. And that sparked my interest as to wanting to detour by there just to get a feel of, of the area. And yeah, as, as I was uh, saying that when we stumbled about, upon this property, we were like, yeah, we'll, we'll go in, have a look. We had a chat with the agent. 
And it turned out that this particular property was a uh, distressed repossession sale, meaning that the vendor, for whatever reasons, couldn't uh, afford to hold onto the property. And so once we uh, we got to uh, the farm, which is where uh, the parents were intending, we, we basically sat down and went into research mode. Now, from our findings, we did we found that the properties in the area of established properties were in that sort of mid to high $300,000 price point. And I was more trying to bridge the gap why an established property is valued in, in that sort of price range versus a new one. I mean, in terms of land component, this, this property was, was on much bigger land 1,200 than square metres yeah. versus the 600 square metre that the, the, the new house was on. And I... I was like, wow, that's such a large discrepancy. And so on top of that, I, I had envisioned that this particular property, the way it was positioned to, towards the front of the lot, we could subdivide because similar enough, the neighbouring property had done just that. So yeah. I was like, right. we can pick this up uh, at a relatively good price and we're, we're laughing. And so we were super interested uh, and... Were, were ready to go to the auction, but essentially there was one problem. So the day of the auction just so happened to be the day that Nicole and I were flying uh, to away to the US <laughs> to I celebrate our one year wedding anniversary. Yeah. Okay. And so there are a couple of things that we had to do in the pipeline in terms of getting your... Oh, yeah, my mom, power of attorney. So... Yeah, we learned that somebody else can purchase a property for you. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we basically put all that in motion and we didn't know whether or not we'd know how the auction went essentially till we got there. And so... As in you weren't on the phone with her, she, well, she just had complete control. So, yeah. So, yeah, well, yeah. We, no, go on. So we pretty much, we didn't know until we got onto the plane. Yeah, right. so prior to that, we basically gave her a brief as to where our limit was yeah. mm -hmm. and said, look, if it falls in within this range, then we're happy to bid to our limit. And we just, yeah, knowing that the time of the auction, we would be somewhere over the Pacific, we just weren't sure <laughs> when we'd find out. Sure, but, sure. But, yeah, we got onto the plane and uh, they actually had... Uh, they had, surprising, they had <laughs> Wi-Fi. Wi Back in the day. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, and so I was going above and beyond to come up. <laughs> I get the Wi-Fi pass that I really want to want to be able yeah, to make yeah. a phone call. And yeah. with with luck behold, yeah. we actually were live on the auction throughout it. That's so cool. On the plane. So yeah. as soon as the hammer went and we knew we'd bought it, we were oh like, yes, what an amazing <laughs> start to the holiday. <laughs> like high-fiving all the other passengers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. So we were like super pumped. Yeah. And so... We, we went on our holiday, we, we then did our thing and came back. And again, similar enough, this, this property was tied. So the, the intent was to, to, to basically tidy it up. We spent uh, 30 odd thousand to add a bedroom, uh, redo the toilet. And within three months, that property increased in value, which then allowed us to leverage in Re, so refinance leverage to buy the next two properties. Yeah. Right. Right. So cool. I mean, you guys definitely don't, uh, yeah, you like a little bit of risk in your life. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. a little bit of calculated it's risk. Kids. It's yeah, right this, kids. Is, this is definitely before kids. Before right, kids. Right, right. Life, life is different before kids, right? Absolutely. You know, I could do overtime and Michael, you just... You were a tradie, so you, tradies are unlimited sometimes, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suppose you don't realise how much time you have available at your fingertips until kids come into the picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I guess this is where it changed, right? Yeah. Like, so yeah. in 2017, yeah. we had eight investment properties. We then realised quickly that mm -hmm. we became heavily heavily negatively geared. I'm talking 700 to $750 a week, which equates to approximately $40,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is despite the granny flat cash flow yeah. and despite buying like relatively inexpensive properties. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
And also throughout that same period, Nicole was pregnant with our firstborn. Mm. Okay. And I was working full time, long hours in what I look back now as a really toxic work environment. Yeah. And so we knew we had cash flow woes. Yeah. And we and both. Yeah, we had a lot of pain for the, like, I had to go back. Like, my maternity leave was, I had to go back at nine months. We couldn't mm. afford me to go for a whole year without pay or anything like that it was like no we need the ca- cash to keep going and I think that's where a lot of people probably struggle to understand property investing right you can't just not have your income coming in I guess yeah it's, 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 what's what's the lesson from that because like on the face of it you'd t- say to someone oh hey by the time we have our first um kid we've got eight properties and people will be like you're winning at life you know but inside you're like a little bit anxious about the cash flow like did you I generally don't know the answer, so I'll ask it anyway. Like, did you just forget to do cash flow planning or did you do it and something, like there was a curveball or like what yeah, happened? Yeah, so uh, just just <laughs> as you bring this up. So then what happened was mm. uh, to alleviate the, the cash flow, We at the time we didn't have spreadsheets. We, we didn't really have, have a strategy. Yeah, strategy, that's the problem. And so we were like, how can we fix this? So we decided to engage a buyer's agent uh, with the intent to secure a commercial property to essentially relieve all our cash flow cash flow issues. What we realized soon after was that was a mistake, which then became a big snowball effect because by the end of 2017, mm-hmm. early into 2018, APRA introduced the Royal Commission to change lending policies and long behold, we became financially stuck. We couldn't move forward. And you'd bought, did you end up buying a commercial place yes, by then? Did. Yes, we did. Do you mind, like, where, where is it? How much did you That's buy it for? In, what kind of yield, like that kind in, of thing? In Queensland, uh, it was low price point entry. Uh, like I'm talking that 300K range. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the yield was, was average. Uh, I mean... I I didn't really know commercial property to the extent that I know today, but we were were sold on things like the fact that uh, all expenses are paid by the tenant, uh, and that there were would be no maintenance costs. Yeah. But that then incorporated with the, the particular tenant we had, they basically were renting back for a twelve month period in the lead up to COVID and. That were they themselves had a gym at the time, and so little did we know what effects were going to come of this in the following year. Right. I guess that's where I learned gross, where people talk about the gross yield versus the net yield. Right. Mm. No one really likes to talk about net yields, and this is all me and Michael now work off is net yields. Um, but everyone talks about gross yield, so it sounded great because mm. I think they were saying that the pitching was like a. Seven to eight percent yield. Rental yield, yeah. But it ended up being like a four to five percent, like net yield or something. Net yield. Well, for a commercial, it's not that. It's short. it's not what you'd expect from yeah, a commercial. Certainly not. I mean, you might expect that in some places now, two thousand twenty-four, but certainly not many years ago. And even, yeah. I, I don't know if you guys will agree with this, but like my experiences, even if it is a six percent net yield in a commercial property. Depends what the definition of net is. Sometimes it excludes exactly. property exactly. management. It includes like make good clauses. It in- excludes uh, like even property management. I didn't realize this until I bought my first commercial property. I was like, when they find you a new tenant, they take like fifteen percent of the whole year's income. Like, <laughs> this is not net. Like, I have to pay yeah. for this, and it, yeah. it's just yeah. it's crazy. Even in commercial, like six percent net can be like like you said, Nicole, like really four percent. Yeah. 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 Really. And then it, yeah, like now when I hear people's deals, I'm like, so what type of yield really is it? Like in the sense that, um, like you said, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. To, to understand that. Time. So as a result of becoming stuck, well, mm-hmm. there wasn't really too much we could do. Everyone was telling us to just increase our income by oh, yeah. a ridiculous amount. And I was like, well, that's yeah. just not going to happen. happen. So we, decided to get super heavily educated and mm. consume as much content as we could. 
Yeah. Then I saw that people were having spreadsheets and I was like, you know what, I'm going to build a spreadsheet. I'm gonna... And then I went to going to like an extent of having a really granular level understanding all the uh, expenses, all the, the the percentages along the way and, yeah. and, and the clips to really work out what a net yield was. And I did that across all our properties. And then really we, we then determined, okay, well, we know what's doing well, what's not. And then yeah. we had a bit more time because in 2019, um, our second child was born, which is our daughter. And at that stage, over the sort of that two to three year period, we, we began cleaning up our portfolio yeah. mm-hmm. uh, to, yeah, to basically leverage and be able to, to get out of that, that financial ceiling that, that we'd hit. Mm-hmm. And then at getting up, like understanding what, um, what, uh, like, um, what the serviceability in the sense that um, yeah. what affects your borrowing, like borrowing capacity. I still had hex debt. I actually didn't know then that the hex debt would affect it so much, and it yeah. wasn't like an extensive hex debt. Um, so right. it was like pay that, like Nick, you need to pay that, and that was one of our just our brokers telling us that, you know. Yeah, well, um, that actually leads me to a, a very interesting point. So. At that point, every single purchase we had done was in our personal names. And so debt to income ratio became a real thing for us. And I had to unpack that as to well, if the lenders are not allowing us to borrow more, like why is that? And and work out well, what is it that we need to change? And then, yeah, that, that took us a little while in yeah. terms of cleaning things up. So, yeah. And, and then also we talked to multiple brokers, by the way. We talked to... Uh, multiple accountants as well and we found our team yeah so we we went down that path we ended up having to sell some properties to free up not only the cash flow burden but also uh, unlock some equity uh and then also we're we're considering as to well do we hold on to some do we do we we sell and after doing that we had a, a surplus amount of funds then we were like well because of that purchase we did in Lake Macquarie, we 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 started the process in getting that subdivided. Right, and um, we also considered selling another property of ours oh, in yeah. Victoria. Victoria, uh, but I just the timing of it was impeccable in the sense that I came across someone who basically suggested, <laughs> well, maybe you don't have to sell. Perhaps you can reconfigure the the arrangement into a rooming house. Yeah, my problem. Okay. And so I was staring down the barrel of do we sell uh, and have to pay capital gains mm-hmm. tax plus all the other costs associated yeah, with the property uh, or do we tap into some of the equity and leverage that to convert it into a rooming house, which yeah. is right. essentially what we did. Yeah. Right. yeah, that was actually a pretty fruitful decision. Um, so we went from like a three-bedroom uh, that was come uh three it had a three bedroom yeah, three, two bathroom yeah but yeah. 350 rent yeah it was only per week 350 per week correct. yeah and then we ended up uh making it into a four unit micro apartment so uh that pretty much four times gave, gave us a four x return to like 1400 per week so yeah. yeah yeah so that that really turned into great. what was that experience like because i've heard i've never done rooming myself i've been tempted but what really puts me off is that, I mean, apart from how banks perceive it and things like that, what puts me off is that it's kind of like quite active as a strategy. Yes, you can get property managers um, that specialize in that, but there's a lot of uh, tenant attrition, mm. maintenance fees are higher, insurance is higher, and it just kind of put me off. But I've never done it, so I'd love to hear from you. Like, it clearly was fruitful, Um mm. Would yes, you do it again or did you do it again or, or what was your experience like? Yeah, yeah. look, we, we had a very positive experience considering how uh, how eventful our, our journey was leading to that point. Uh, and and I do agree with what you're saying. I mean, insurances are higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, and only one insurer. Was there's only a, a set amount, I think three insurers across the country that will insure rooming houses. And yes, Lenders definitely look at rooming houses at a different perspective. Yeah. Uh, what I mean by that is they'll look at it more on a commercial valuation basis than a residential because there's there's an element of risk associated with that. And, yeah, not all property managers will take them on. As well. Not, not all property managers are fit to be able yeah. to 
know how to not only um, uh, screen the, the, the particular tenants, because in essence you need to have every tenant somewhat flow. You just yeah. can't have yeah. one person who's a, a professional working five yeah. days a week and then someone else is on like, yeah. you know, no, jobless basically. Yeah. You got to make sure that there's there's harmony within the property. Exactly. Part of that is is making sure that when uh, when the tenant applications come through, that someone's got a process to revise and and make sure that the person is the right fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, other things to consider is yeah, property management fees are definitely oh, higher. Wow. Uh, I think we're paying yeah we're paying twelve percent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what that includes is basically everything in the sense that if at any stage a tenant leaves, we're not hit with uh, letting fees or anything yeah. as such. It's, it's right. a inclusive, all inclusive package. Got it. And that's, so, not, that's not so bad. It's pretty reasonable. Right. I mean, in yeah. Perth, you can pay up to that just for a normal house. So it's, it's not Exactly, that exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was really good. And then after we did all the numbers, it, it still worked out very favorable. So we were like, well, we're going we're gonna to pull the trigger on this. And nice. uh, we've had it now for a few years. And between tenancies, I mean, yeah, it might take two to three weeks to yeah. fill a particular room. But at the end of the day, we've diversified to four separate rental incomes. And even if one yeah. is vacant, like we're still 3Xing our return relative to what we had prior. Yeah, Yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah, so um, I think in a nutshell, from, yeah, from that point on, it sort of it made us begin to refine our, like our processes, our methodologies, our strategies. Like you know, we've gone from a novice investor to an intermediate investor to probably I would say because we were able to flip that negatively geared portfolio to one that we could technically then keep going. Right, like yeah. we were able to get out of that whole i think you'd you'd probably put us then into like more of an advanced investor um and that mindset of keep going and growing was probably the endurance that we had in the game and i think that's the most important thing that you can ever have is endurance right Mm. but i think our strategy is the value add perspective of like we just don't buy and hold we have some type of value add to the to our purchases, not all, but to our, we, most of our purchases is what made us be able to leverage and grow. Yeah, we, we found that through some of those particular strategies, we just had a fruitful experience. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it's the renovations, right? Like we've done cosmetic and structural, great. People have done that too, but we've refined our processes to having a template that we can go off that we don't overcapitalize. We don't put emotions into it whatsoever. Mm. We've learned to make clear, like, for every dollar spent, you get three times return. So for every dollar, three dollars back. Uh, don't go overcapitalizing. So 10% of the purchase price is like a rule of thumb for the reno kind yeah, of thing. Don't, don't overspend. Yeah. Um, you know, granny flats, great for cash flow. Um, different states have different, you know, rules and make sure you just... Before, if you want to put a granny flat onto the per, like the house that you're purchasing, just make sure you can. Make sure that mm. there's no sewer at the back. Make sure that Easements. there's um, easements, yeah, or like, you know, there's nothing that's going to make you not be able to, you know, or that you will have extra costs. Um, and that stuff is hard because you don't, like, you won't even know if you want to do a granny flat if you're a newbie investor. And so yeah, exactly. even as something as simple as, like the sewer, you just have to go to dial before you dig. Let's say you're in Queensland, like the website's free. It tells you, is there a sewage line in the backyard? But you don't even know to check that because you don't even know what a granny flat is. Some councils on their website will have council maps. So they'll have maps that you can see um, any kind of electrical line. Where, where any of these services, services are the utility. Are. So, you know, you just got to know that that's available to you and now online it's it's amazing what you can find i guess and then you know we've done s- small developments as well like the retain and build is sort of what we like um and the reason why we like that is purely because um we're creating more value because mm. you're manufacturing what um yeah. much you're essentially manufacturing equity mm. so <laughs> like, like with that property that we secured in in lake macquarie um yeah. we, we bought the land 
at, at essentially wholesale price with the property on there and and with how the market went on with the, the years that followed it, it increased mm-hmm. and we were then able to to build a brand new lot on the back so we didn't have to pay the land component all we had to pay was the build cost and so yeah. once that was finalized and subdivided all of a sudden we've got two properties with with two titles and all of a sudden, yeah, we, we've been able to manufacture some some serious okay. equity. But also during the construction costs, uh, during the sorry construction period, you have somebody renting the front property, so you're not like dry, sure. right? Sure. So you're not really like yeah, you don't have those holding costs essentially yeah. burning a hole in your pocket. Right. That Paul Macquarie property sounds pretty perfect to be honest, because it had that subdivision value add potential. Um, and it was just, I think it was just bought at the perfect time. <laughs> it's probably it's more probably than doubled and. It is one of our strong assets and we have actually put a granny flat on it as well. So, there you go. So I was, income streams. <laughs> so I was super ambitious um, when I was speaking with the town planners about this because I I was optimistic that maybe we could get three separate dwellings on the property and they were like, no, nah, nah. you can't do that. I said, well, what's the next, next best thing? And then he goes, look. Uh, given the size being 1,200 squares, we can make the battle axe block uh, as small as we can, essentially allowing the front lot to have 580 or thereabouts, whatever that, whatever it was. Right. And what that allowed us was that uh, it allowed us to be able to put a granny flat in between the front property and the rear property. Yeah. Right. right. And uh, we, we leveraged uh, the equity that we gained from the the subdivision to then fund that granny flat so every time we're it just doesn't. trying to to leverage what we've done to be able to get us to the next position yeah I, I think it needs to be said as well like i didn't hear you say before that put port macquarie one it's not like you'd done yeah, just already a half a dozen subdivisions yeah. like you're you're getting these results because you're you're finding the right people through trial and error and you're asking the right questions and I just want to I just want that point to hit home to everyone because it can be very easy for someone to passively listen or watch this and say like oh yeah but Michael's a tradie like you know he kind of just knows this stuff or (laughs) Nicole just kind of knows this stuff or whatever but like you genuinely didn't like you were like a a newbie developer you could say I don't know if that's a fair thing but um but you asked the question and unless you ask the question to the town planner they're not going to off their own bat be like, oh, by the way, I can make you some money. If we do this, da, 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 then you can get a granny flat and three income streams from the same, you know, initial block. They're not, no one's going to care about you. You have to ask that. Well, you did. And I think credit yeah, yeah. credit yeah. goes um, to you because of that. And I'm, I'm also getting a sense that if you had not had this constant value add uh, strategy, whether it's renovation, granny flat, subdivision, you rooming, you could have easily sold that house, but instead you decided to make it a multiple income sort of factory, uh, not factory, that's a metaphor, but um, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like if you had not done that, you wouldn't be in this position you are right now. And then that's a great lesson to me and for everyone else as well, that sure, you can be a buy and hold investor passive, and that's completely fine. If you know, you don't care, you don't have enough time or whatever, and that will get you out of your rat race, but it'll just take a long time. But you can get there quicker and more in an accelerated fashion if you put in some sweat equity or you do some value add. And I think there's too many people who sort of doubt themselves and think, I can't do that. That sounds really overwhelming. That sounds like you need to be a professional. That sounds like you need to have background in electrician or, tra- or some sort of trade to be able to achieve those outcomes, but you don't. Like I know that gave you a big leg up being a, a, a in, in trade and having those contacts, but anyone can do it. You know, they yeah, might make yeah. a few more mistakes, but everyone can do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most definitely. Uh, so those are some things that I, I took out, which, um, yeah, which is commendable to, to your effort for sure. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and then I guess, uh, what, 2020? No, 20. Oh, yeah, 20, so I, I, yeah, after we sort of cleaned that up and did that, um, COVID hit. Uh, and we began helping friends, friends and, and family, and family uh, throughout that period because they'd obviously seen that we'd been in this space for a little while and they saw what we were doing. Um, and then... Yeah, look, I, I, I came across a really sad story. Um, one of my friends from nursing was pretty much taken down a, a, like a rabbit hole uh, in her purchase. It was a lot of 
um, oh, but you need to put this extra cost in and this extra cost in. And she was like, I thought it was all done prior, mm. the purchase. Mm. So it was a lot of red flags and that got me going, oh, just super angry and then going, you know what, you need to have a campaign so that's not list like linked to whoever you're going and purchasing through um, and sent her to our people, which sort of, I guess, made me go, oh, my goodness, we have a team. Yeah, <laughs> like- and, and, and I guess off the back of that, there was a suggestion made as yeah. to, well, you guys have been doing this for a little while and you seem to be doing okay at it. Why don't you you, you turn it into a business? And so we were like, no, we oh, <laughs> why don't we? And so... Yeah. Oh, yeah. in, in in 2022 we decided we're like well, let's do our our real estate license and soon after that we we launched a business yeah and i think that's how some of the best businesses start right it's just by osmosis it's like you've already gone through the trials and tribulations and it's like other people having to tell you that you're an expert and you should perhaps start helping people i know i mean i don't want to say that's necessarily what happened to you but that, that's exactly what happened to me and i you know you kind of you don't have confidence in yourself but then enough people tell you that you can do it for them then it's like yeah, yeah i'm actually half decent at this <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah, yeah exactly and yeah. so organically yeah and so once we 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 started that we, we were gaining clients um, I was still on a mission. Well, we were both really oh, always on a mission to keep to, growing to keep and... growing our knowledge base, and I think that's when I came across some of your videos on on YouTube, and so began starting started <laughs> to follow your content uh, and the value that you were provided. I mean, it seemed like you were gen- a genuine and humble individual, and <laughs> Nicole and I we, we we share those core. How values. did that come across when you're you're like? You're budding buyers agents, and then you have this guy on YouTube saying, "Don't use a buyers agent." Well, well, yeah, you but know, it was for some of the points you were saying. I think that we were like, "Yeah, I can say." Well, right. to be completely transparent, I mean, I think that's what sparked our interest that In you had a dislike yeah. for buyers agents. <laughs> and I was so like, "Oh, this this could be interesting." Okay. Um, yeah. And so then we we're like, "Oh, uh, after a while, we're like, let's let's just sign up. Like, what's the worst that can happen? We might learn a thing or two and and perhaps improve and." And so, so we did. So we did. It added metrics, refined the way we were analyzing data points, yeah. topping up our knowledge, and that, with what we already knew from the value add side of things, was able to optimize our invest investment strategy. Meaning that not only are we targeting high growth areas uh, from capital and rental growth, but mm. emerging markets. And that embedded with some of the value add knowledge mm, that we have. That we have. Now we look for opportunities that have that embedded value add in them. Yeah. So, what it's shown us is that you can really supercharge your your results. And and we were able to. And we were able to. And I guess in nice. addition to that, there were some things that helped us streamline and and eliminate things like boots on the ground, like yeah. when from totally. when we had done our uh, initial visit to Queensland. So yeah, yep. it's always, it's always a little bit humbling, you know, when, um, when people who have already been very experienced in their investing, they do the course and it's almost like, oh, why are you guys doing my course? Like you already know how to develop, you already know how to subdivide, you already have bought, you know, n- n- you know so many properties. But I, the conclusion yeah. I've sort of come to myself is these people do it because they want to layer it, the strategies they want. They already know how to manufacture value, but then if they can create an underpinning be- underneath that, which is just using data to find you know good income and, and good growth suburbs, short-term, uh, medium-term and long-term, and then they can add their own expertise of value add, then it's like the best of both worlds. I remember I used to get calls years and years ago from developers, and I was like, I felt like, what's that word um uh self self sabotage i was like i don't i used to tell them i'm like i don't think you need my course and like many of them uh, turned away because of that but i think in hindsight it could have val- it could have added value to them because they didn't know how to pick the next suburb but they knew how to make money from a a, a existing title or block or 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 site but if combining the two i think is is very powerful so after this you know after doing the course how many more properties have you bought we probably don't have time to go into like every single one of them but but how has it gone since that time 
Yeah. Uh, so pretty much re re well, we've purchased four. Oh, we, we I mean, since the course, we've purchased a lot more properties, but I don't know whether you we want to go down the the fact of for our own portfolio or for clients because oh, yeah. in turn, I mean, it streamlined streamlined the way we look at it at a whole. So. Yeah. What the, the we basically the same way we plan for purchases for ourselves is now how we plan out the purchases for our clients and in turn ex- basically replicating and repeating rinse and repeat. Is what yeah, yeah, brilliant. So we we know what we're going to be doing to the property prior to purchase, um, and I think that's the most most important thing to do when you're an investor, mm. uh, especially if you want to go be an active investor know exactly all the due diligence that need to go behind in knowing what you're going to be doing with that land, if you're going to be doing something with that land or with that house, you know, doing your course also educated financially in the sense of structuring Mm -hmm. um, and strategies. I think that's really important. You know, the broker that you're using, are they an investor-based broker or are they just doing mortgages and they're not really thinking of invest like an investing mm. strategy. Um, if you're at that point that you need an accountant on board, does your accountant understand property investing? Yeah. And, you know, and if you have a financial planner, are they a financial planner that understands property as well or are they a salesperson, typically speaking, that yeah. is selling you, I don't know. Just- I'm actually keen to get your input from a uh, for i guess if you've dealt with financial planners because mm. from my experience a, a lot of them tend to have their agenda as to pushing towards stocks and not really understanding overly too much about property do you feel that you've had similar experiences i think so like in my own experiences um i've because, you know, when you want to create wealth, you kind of people say, go see a financial planner. Mm. And so I did on multiple occasions. But I find that their expertise lies in um, finding the right insurances as per your personal situation. Um, they're also quite useful if you're in your latter years and you want to do superannuation planning and making sure you things like, can I get the pension if if I'm asset tested this way or how can I maneuver my assets or whatever to get my annuity, like that kind of thing, which kind of goes mm. over my head to be honest, from a structuring perspective. Um, they're also, you know, they're brokers in terms of they recommend mutual funds, managed funds, um, funds of funds and and stocks and things like that. But I don't think that's where their expertise lies because I used to work in an investment bank and, you know, investment bankers spend 90 hours a week looking at this stuff. Financial planners spend two hours a week, maybe two hours a day. But at the same time, I I don't want to poo-poo them too much because I have so many financial planners and clients and they're the first ones to very quickly point out to me that, hey, PK, that's not true for all financial planners and there are actually some that are terrific and actually have property expertise as well and won't just recommend a property for tax reasons, won't just recommend a property because they're getting a kickback even though most of them do. You know, like in any profession, I think there's there's some solid uh, financial planners, but my still to synergize everything, my honest opinion is that if you want to use real estate as your prime vehicle for retirement planning and wealth creation, then you don't need a financial planner. Um, But if you're the type of person that, you know, you're not really interested in knowledge accumulation and you just want to outsource, then, you know, it's probably good to see a financial planner at some stage, especially closer to retirement. I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with that, but that's kind of my honest thoughts. Yeah, Yeah. I I tend to to agree. I mean, there's a time and place for everyone in their journey. Yeah. No, but I think that's a really good solid point that you made around, you know, you need to have the right people in your team and, and people that have, that are sort of quantitative, have, have data um, based insights. And even as you guys, you know, you're making, you said you've streamlined your process. So you know exactly what you're doing with the property, why you're buying there, what value add you're providing, because I think, um, 
you know, without data, you're just another person with an opinion. <laughs> and so, you know, who, who really, who cares about what PK says, who cares about what Michael says, it's only the data that we're leaning on that is actually valuable and, and, and the experience as well, of course. So um, I think that that's a terrific thing. In terms of your, your, your portfolio, and once again, please let me know um, if you're not uh, comfortable sharing and that's completely okay but now you have i think if i can remember 11 titles 17 rentals or streams of income um do you have a sense of like to total portfolio worth what's your lvr what's your total sort of um positive cash flow position and and i think it's also worth saying whilst um while you while you answer that just because you know just because you only have 20k passive income or 50k passive income or 100k passive income that doesn't mean that you're not successful or successful i think people may um hear stories of someone who's been investing for 10 years or something and be like oh they've only got like 40k passive income like is that really worth it all that effort and but it's like no no you have to see the forest from the trees now that they've done all this legwork give it another 10 years for the fruit to ripen and that 40k becomes 200k or, or something like that <laughs> yeah um so so what do, uh, is is kind of a kind of yeah, upfront no, question, but what's your financial <laughs> finance what's your personal finances look like <laughs> <laughs> so we pretty much what the approximate value for the portfolio standard Six, i think about seven, seven and a half yeah. mil from okay. when, when we checked uh, our LVR, uh, according from my spreadsheet, because it, it literally looks at everything now, is was about 60%. 60%. I think that's yeah, where we're about. But, solid, solid. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're in a pretty favourable position. At the moment, we're going through a bit of a refinance because there are some properties that we're uh, looking at um, adding value to. So our cash flow situation might be a bit skewed, but it's it's in and around that six figure mark. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty decent. And we're also transferring some into um, from our own names. Yeah. To, um, to Re restructuring. So, sure. Uh, part of that is the rooming house, as an example. So, we bought that in our personal names at the time, but given the fact it's now very heavily cash flow positive. We're now in a position where, because it's in our individual names and in our individual tax brackets are uh, uh, nominated higher, it actually made financial sense to discuss things with the accountant as to what it would look like if we were to transfer it into a discretionary trust. The reason for that is we aim to hold it till till the end of time, essentially. <laughs> yeah. um, and some of the things that we had to consider was, well, in a discretionary trucks, the tax bracket is lower. Mm -hmm. uh, what the payback period in doing so? I mean, you've got to allow for capital gain. You've got to allow mm -hmm. for stamp duty and and paying back all the depreciation that you claim back from the government. So there was a lot of back and forth and with the, the accountant to the make it actually costs as well. yeah to make it deter like to determine whether it's viable. Uh, so yeah, that was that was something else that that's happening as well. Right, it's a tough decision. I, what I think is notable is that you guys have been fairly emotionless about your real estate decisions. Like you've bought, sold properties. You've you've really just lent on the numbers, especially sort of halfway on from your journey. You've kind of been like, okay, let's get strategic. Let's just take the emotion out of it and let's just go for it. And that's like, it's not easy to do, not least with three kids now and, and, and well, a growing family. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always say when you're growing a property portfolio, you've got to treat it like a business. Um, yeah. yeah, like it's about the returns. It's about the numbers. It's about the mathematics behind it. Um, nothing short of it, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we, we probably have to end it there. I, I could sort of go down rabbit holes and explore other things forever. But I just want to ask you one last question. Um, for someone who is, let's let's go here. For someone who's got already a few properties and I don't know, for whatever reason, they're underperforming or they haven't been performing as well as they ought to have. And they're like, you know, I've tried property investing. I might've done it myself, might've used a buyer's agent, whatever. I don't know if it's really for me, you know, like it's a lot of work. I've made mistakes. Uh, I'd rather just chuck it into, 
you know, the ASX 200 and we'll see how it, <laughs> I'll see how it goes. Um, this is not like a share versus property question, but just like a general mindset question. What would you say to folks like that? I mean, what I'm only basing this of our experience. And when I say that is get educated and mm. always maintain that, that growth mindset. I mean, when we hit that roadblock, I knew there were still plenty of investors that had already cracked the, the ceiling of 10 plus properties. So I was like, well, they've done it. They yeah. must have worked out a way to get there. It's yeah. not that they, they stumbled across it by accident. So one of the things I was like telling myself and, and Nicole is we've we got to start thinking like a, a top 1% investor. And, yeah. and at the end of the day, I feel based on our experience, like the earlier you start, the bigger advantage you'll have in the long run, mm. as as you touched on earlier. Yeah, so it's just get educated, know your finances as well. Start with um, talking to anyone and everyone you can to sort of get a broader perspective of maybe there's something in your mindset that is just holding you um, behind as well. Like think outside the box. We did for one mm. of our purchases, and that was that rooming house, for instance. Um, but you, you don't have to go down those kind of strategies if it's not for you, but you can explore different types of ways that could get you unstuck mm. if that's yeah. what's happening. And I think community as well, putting yourself in a community that can help you brainstorm, mm -hmm. just take on a bit of information that you didn't even know of. Mm. Um, but, yeah, like Michael said, having that growth mindset, start thinking like that 1% investor, what would that 1% investor do versus just what you're thinking right now might be a pinnacle point for you too. Mm. Um, and get your goals in line. Make sure there that you have a strategy that's going to get you there. So reverse engineer it. Yeah, I feel that's like if an investor's gotten to that stage where they've got a few properties under their belt and all of a sudden they become stuck, I've, I genuinely believe that perhaps maybe the strategy wasn't necessarily the right one or maybe yeah. there was no strategy. Uh, I'm not sure about your own personal journey, but yeah, it took us a while before we were like, well, we needed to implement and refine a strategy uh, to allow us to keep going and progress because we too got stuck. And so, yeah, determining, you know, what kind of investment is going to be right for you, determining whether you want a negative gear, do you understand if you want to do positive gear and are you going to rely on the big four banks or are you going to use second tier, third tier lenders? I mean, yeah, that I incorporates. Sure. And perhaps and ask questions. Don't forget to ask questions. And if you're not getting the, the answers from that broker that whoever you're asking questions to, you know, yeah, just make sure, pick up the phone and call someone else. Ma really? make, yeah, <laughs> like, I'd probably say, yeah, <laughs> make, make sure you, you understand what you're investing in. I yeah. think probably right. my way from, from that. Right. So, and so many takeaways um, that you guys shared. And I think my biggest takeaway from your entire journey is, is just that how important strategy is. I mean, I definitely know when I was a first time property investor, what rang in my head was like hotspot, where should I invest? But that's like not even important. You know, what is important is lending strategy, your, your portfolio strategy, you know, structuring strategy, all this sort of thing. Invest in the unsexy stuff like that. And then things like hotspots can come later, you know, like it'll take care of itself. But no, I'm truly humbled that, um, I definitely can't take any credit whatsoever for anything that you guys have done, but I'm I'm very happy to have played my small little part in whatever way that that I have, and I have to congratulate you on on not only constantly pivoting and like just getting yourself out of jail again and again and again, um, but also landing yourself in in such a strong financial position. I didn't realize that that you had such a strong passive income outcome, and that's a testament to you. And and like you said at the start, Michael, um, you're on modest income. When I'm not talking to an investment banker here, I'm not talking to a I don't know a surgeon or, or some business owner that makes millions of dollars every year i'm talking to like normal people that have just hustled and i know definitely when you came to my event in sydney last year i'm looking yeah. at you nicole um you're like the most cheerful outgoing loud in a good way person in the room <laughs> and, and i think that that sort of speaks to to 
kind of like the mindset that you need, like, you know, just put yourself out there. There are others who have been successful in real estate. Why can't I, you know, why can't you? Sure. We all can't get the same level of success, but do the best with what you have, but don't leave any money on the table. And I don't think you guys have left any money on the table. And because you've streamlined your processes and, 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 and data and your layered stack strategy, now you're, you're helping so many others. And I always say, and, and I think people, misconstrue me. I, I genuinely believe that most buyers agents are genuinely not worth it. In fact, I'll be happy to put a figure on that and say 90% plus. <laughs> um, but I always say, and somehow this book gets edited out, that some are actually really good. You know, And, um, and if you don't have any time because of various reasons, um, or no interest in, in learning and educating, then there are some decent people left in the world. <laughs> and and yeah, I hope you yeah. guys are amongst them. But I still think like, I don't even care about my course. I still think people should get educated. Yeah. You know, you can only be yourself, right? And like, we love, that's like, we love property. <laughs> <laughs> it's our passion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And yeah, it's just provided us with, with options. I mean, now that, that we have a family, rather than being forced to do something like a nine to five that you might not necessarily enjoy, we we do it purely because we enjoy it and the opportunities that it can bring to people's lives. Yeah, and we want to help change people's lives as well. Like we want to get mm. we want to get people through until their goals. You know, let's get yeah. their goals going. Let's- Let's That's awesome. Well, you'll have a, as your business grows and, and your kids grow, you're going to have like a strong team, a family team of buyers <laughs> agents and little little kids are going to be like typing away on their spreadsheets in five or six years time. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. that didn't sound, that didn't come out as well as I thought it in my head. Sounds a bit like slave labor, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, but no, that was great. I was, ta- I was talking to a client yesterday and she was saying her eight-year-old um, was asked to do like a painting at school, like a picture. And he drew one house after another house after another house. And the teacher was like, what have you drawn? And this eight-year-old, I'm not making this up, eight-year-old was like, well, my mom's a property investor. And what you can do um, is you can buy one house and take the equity and buy another one. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm getting to 10 houses. And so, that is amazing. so how amazing is that? She was talking about the, the, no, the son, the eight-year-old, he was talking about equity. And I was like, yeah, that that's pretty cool, and to be oh. able to do that for your kids. Yeah, absolutely. She should keep that. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. No, we'll wrap it up there. This is a super long interview, but hopefully, people are still with us and got a ton of value. But thank you so much, Michael and and Nicole. You guys have been awesome. Thank oh, you, no, PK. Thanks, PK. Thanks for having us on. I'm sure we'll catch up soon. hundred percent. And thank you, everyone, for watching or listening wherever you are. You know, there's like more than, I don't even know, 110, 120 of these client interviews on my client results playlist. But I honestly don't care if you do my course or not, but at least go through and watch and listen to them because you'll learn so much. You'll become educated and inspired to take the next step for yourself, whatever that may be. So hit the subscribe button, give it a like. And thank you again, guys. Oh, thanks, Thanks, PK. PK.